Supposing that I live in a high crime area, and that when I left home this morning, I switched on the burglar alarm, as I always do, and it really matters whether I switch it on or not. How do I know that I switched it on? Well, I remember switching it on. My recollection that I switched on the burglar alarm gives me confidence that I switched it on. And this confidence is based on a kind of trust which I'm going to call self-trust. I trust myself to know, to be, able, to be capable of knowing whether I switched on the alarm or not. And it's not just that I am confident that I switch it on, I have the right to be confident. I have the right to be confident as long as my memory is in fact reliable. It's not just that I do trust myself, I have the right to trust myself, again, as long as I'm generally reliable about this kind of thing. Okay. Now, supposing that uh, you were with me this morning for some reason, um, and you say to me now, look, you didn't switch it on. You're telling me that you did, but I saw you. I saw you leave the house, and I saw that you didn't switch it on. Okay. And then you might remind me of all the previous occasions when I forgot to do something which I thought I'd done. Okay, so you go on at me. Now, if you're convincing enough, what you might achieve is the implanting of doubts in my mind about whether I switched on the alarm or not. I started off pretty confident that I did, but now I'm not so sure. I started off trusting myself. Now I don't. And the effect of this loss of confidence, this loss of self-trust, the effect, I want to suggest, is loss of knowledge. I've gone from knowing something that I switched on the alarm to not knowing it, right? and I've gone from knowing to not knowing as a result of these doubts which you've implanted in my mind. The more I doubt, the less I know. The less confident I am in myself and in my beliefs, the less I know. Knowledge requires a certain degree of confidence. Knowledge requires a certain degree of trust. Not just trust in other people, but trust in yourself, trust in you, the knower. Now, if that's right, then there's a very effective way of depriving someone else of their knowledge. If you want to deprive someone else of their knowledge, a really effective way of doing that is to erode their confidence and to erode their trust in themselves. And in the burglar alarm example, I want to just make a couple of observations which I think are quite important. The first observation is that I can lose my knowledge in this example, regardless of whether I did or didn't switch on the alarm. Even if I did switch on the alarm, even if I'm right and you're wrong, I can still end up not knowing whether I switched on the alarm or not. Right? So it's not that I, I no longer know because the facts have changed. The facts haven't changed. Right? I did switch on the alarm. Okay, so it, 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 the loss of knowledge is the result of a change in me, in my psychology, rather than a change in the world. Okay, the, the second thing I want to say about this example, which I think is also quite important, is that it actually doesn't matter whether you really believe that I switched on the alarm or not. I mean, maybe you're just messing with me. I mean, I mean maybe you're just making it your mission to undermine my confidence. And people do that sometimes, right? I mean, maybe you just, you're just messing with my head. Okay, so at the point at which I finally say, well, I don't know, maybe I didn't switch on the alarm. You've kind of won, right? And, and, and you've, you, you've won, you've succeeded in implanting these doubts, self-doubt in me, regardless of whether you believe that I have any reason to doubt myself. 
Okay, so what I've just described is how you can go from knowing to not knowing, even though there's been no change in the facts. That's what I've just described. Okay, and that's what I call the problem of disappearing knowledge. A person's knowledge can be made to disappear, to vanish, by undermining their self-confidence and their self-trust. Okay, what's that got to do with fake news and conspiracy theories? So what I want to suggest to you is that one of the actual and indeed intended effects of the proliferation of fake news and conspiracy theories is to undermine, to erode our confidence in our ability to know what the world around us is like and how it works. And by eroding our confidence in our ability to know, they actually erode our ability to know. Okay, so just to, just to remind you, knowing requires a degree of confidence, it requires a degree of self-trust. By undermining that, you actually undermine knowledge. And you can do that without, without, without any change in the facts. So let me give you, let me give you an example. So supposing that um, I believe the official account, as people like to call it, the official account of what happened on 9-11. Now, if, I expose, if, I'm, if I'm exposed to lots and lots of conspiracy theories about 9-11, the result of that exposure may well be to make me doubt what actually happened. I might end up thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was a conspiracy. Okay, now that effect, that, 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 that transformation of my um, attitude towards 9-11 was brought about by my exposure to, the, to, to, a, to, to a particular theory, exposure to conspiracy theories. Okay, and I want to suggest that that is fundamentally the point of these theories. I mean, of course, sometimes people put forward conspiracy theories because they want to discredit somebody or for some other, for some other reason. But one of, the, one of the effects of these theories is to, is to instill, to implant doubts in our minds and to make us no longer confident in our own beliefs about the way the world works. Now, of course, from the perspective of the conspiracy theories, that's exactly the aim. I mean, the thought... That, that someone who wants to propose one of these theories may have is that, well, you have no right to believe the official account because the official account is in fact false. Okay. But the point I want to make is that actually, regardless of whether the official account is true or not, regardless of that, I can still go from my initial state of believing something to not believing it as a result of exposure to conspiracy theories. Now, of course, the 9-11 the, the example is very, very controversial, uh, and, and I don't want to, to, to take a stand on that for today's purposes. So let me now give you another example, which I hope is much less controversial. So one of the, one of the, the, the most um, p pernicious conspiracy theories around today is the theory that the Holocaust is a myth. Many of you will have come across this uh, this theory. Now, uh, of course, w w one thing that I is very striking is, is how Holocaust denial in the internet age has become more and more prevalent. There's more and more evidence of people subscribing to some version of Holocaust denial. Now, in the psychological literature, there's lots of discussion of why people believe conspiracy theories in the first place and what are the social consequences of belief in conspiracy theories. I'm not really interested for the moment in why people believe them or in the social consequences. I'm just interested in the consequences for people's knowledge. So, essentially, if you start off believing the received account of the Holocaust, but you then have prolonged exposure to lots of Holocaust-denying websites, you could end up, and indeed lots of people do end up, in the position of, of wondering, well, I don't know what really happened. Okay, so that's, an that's another example of, of, of how 
you can go from knowing to not knowing as a result of having doubts implanted in your mind by these sorts of theories. Okay, so this raises a kind of practical question. What's the appropriate response then? If we want to protect our knowledge, if we, want to, if we want to protect our knowledge, for example, of the reality of the Holocaust, what do we need to do? Now, there are, on the face of it, there are kind of two responses. There are two responses that you could have. One response is ignore, and the other response is rebut. Okay, so the ignore response says something like this. The ignore response says, look, I mean, if the result of exposure to these theories is to make you doubt yourself or to doubt what you have always taken to be the case, then maybe the right response is just to ignore them, to avoid them. Don't engage with them. No good will come of it. So that's the, that's the, that's the ignore res the response. But that response doesn't seem to me to be satisfactory. It's not satisfactory for a whole variety of different reasons. Okay, so, so one reason is this. Ignoring these theories, for a start, seems like a case of intellectual cowardice. I mean, the obvious thing to think is, look, if you're, if you're so convinced that something happened, and somebody else says to you, no, it didn't, then you need to be able to defend yourself. You need to be able to give reasons in support of the claim that it did happen. It's not enough to just bury your head in the sand and say, I'm not listening to you, however obnoxious or repulsive the views are that, that are being put to you. I think there's also a moral obligation to stand up for the truth. There's a moral obligation to stand up for the facts. It's not a game. I mean, it actually matters what happened in the Second World War. It actually matters what happened on 9-11 and so on. So again, it's important, it's essential to actually show what the facts are, to concentrate on the facts. And I think it's important also not to be suckered into thinking that, well, it's all a matter of opinion. It isn't all a matter of opinion. It's a matter of what actually happened. So suppose you agree then that the appropriate response in these cases is actually to engage with the theories that are being put to you and to show that you're right and they're wrong, if they are wrong. All right, so in the, in the case of Holocaust denial, you might think, and indeed I do think, that the appropriate response is not to say I'm going to ignore them, but the appropriate response is to actually rebut them by looking at the facts and the evidence. And of course now we run into a real practical problem. And the practical problem is that most of us lack the expertise to really be able to say what the evidence sh shows. I mean, I, with regard to 9-11, I'm not a structural engineer, I'm not a physicist, I'm not in a position really to determine what happened that day. In the case of the Holocaust, I'm not a historian. I mean, I don't have the, uh, the historical knowledge or the skills uh, to, to, to defend the official account on the basis of documentary evidence. So there's a kind of problem now. The problem is that on the one hand, it's very easy to lose knowledge by having these theories put to you and not being able to respond to them. And that problem is, 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 is made worse by the fact that actually most of us don't have the expertise that's required to respond. And of course, that's in, in many ways what these, what these theories exploit. So you, you, may th you, you may think you know what's going on, but somebody says to you, yes, but what about this, what about that? What's your answer to this question? What's your answer to that question? And it's very easy to get to the point of saying, well, I don't know, hey, leave me alone, I don't know. Well, I think that's, it's, it's true that most of us don't have the expertise and don't have the time to really tackle these theories head on. But fortunately, there are people who do have the expertise and who do have the time, and these people are called experts. So we're sometimes told that, that, that we, well, we don't need experts, or that, well, you know, there's no such thing as an expert. It's just your opinion or it's just my opinion. And I think that's, that's exactly what needs to be resisted. I think whether someone is an expert or not, for example, an expert on German history or an expert on 
aeronautical engineering, or so, that is not a matter of opinion. Whether someone is competent and qualified to pronounce on these subjects is, I think, to some extent, an objective matter. It's a matter of their qualifications, their experience, their knowledge, and so on, their track record. These are all the, re these are all the relevant factors. So I think that when faced with this loss of, the threat of the loss of knowledge, the only way to really protect our knowledge, the only way to actually say, look, there is a difference between truth and falsity, there is the possibility of deciding what happened, is to draw on the work of people who are competent to judge. And I think it's worth, it's worth also asking those who are propounding these uh, uh, various conspiracy theories, it's worth asking them, well, what's your competence to judge? It's all very well you saying that you don't know what you're talking about, or you're not, you're not qualified to judge. Are they qualified to judge? Some of them might be, but certainly not all. Okay, so, so, so that's, the, that's, the, that's the story I want to tell. Right? It, it seems to me that all of us now are living in a world in which there is a tremendous amount of stuff out there, online particularly, there's a conspiracy theory for absolutely everything, and I'm certainly not saying that all conspiracy theories are false. And I don't really want to get into a discussion of the truth or falsity of particular conspiracy theories, but what I do want to suggest to you is that these theories can have this effect of just bewildering us, of making us think, it's just all too complicated, I just don't know what to think anymore. And the, and, and the ultimate result is the whole idea of, well, there's no such thing as truth, hence post-truth politics. And I think that's what needs to be avoided. But it can't be avoided just by ignoring, just by ignoring this phenomenon. So, so here's a kind of motto that I want to end with. When faced with all these theories that question our beliefs about, for example, the Holocaust, the motto should not be ignore, ignore, ignore. The motto should be rebut, rebut, rebut. Thanks for listening.